I want to take a, a few moments and I, I, I want to kind of lay a, the foundation for the sermon today. Um, you know, probably hundreds of times you have heard someone uh, make this statement. I know you've heard it. You've heard it recently. Uh, how many times have you heard somebody say, seeing is believing? You ever heard somebody say that? Seeing is believing. If I, can, if I can see it, I'll believe it. Seeing is believing. You know, when I, when I looked at that, because I, I don't know, I just felt uh, compelled as the Spirit of the Lord spoke something in my spirit. I started looking at that, and, and I found out that that, that that phrase there, seeing is believing, is, is literally, it's, a, it, it, it's, an, it's an idiom. And it's, an, and it's an idiom that has, according to, History, it's an idiom that has its origin, the first place that it is recorded anywhere. Uh, that, that particular statement is found, it was back in 1639. But I, I, but I begun to realize that that thought was far be, uh, that you know, came about many hundreds of years ago, long before 1639 was that thought there. And as, as a matter of fact, it, it, it dates back to a place in Scripture. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 20 and verse 25. And while you're doing that, you're looking at verse 25, let me ask you this question. Today's sermon is in the form of a question. Is seeing, is seeing believing? Is seeing believing we're going to talk about that because I believe the scripture has something different to say. It's seeing, believe it. In John 20, verse 25, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. And after his resurrection, he has appeared before the, the disciples. They have seen him. On this particular night, there's a disciple that is missing. And his name is Thomas. The other disciples go to Thomas and they say, Thomas, We've seen the Lord. Now, you know who Thomas is referred to in Scripture. He's referred to as doubting Thomas. His response to them is here in verse 25, when they tell him they've seen the Lord, this is what Thomas says to them. They told him, we have seen the Lord, but he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and I place my hand into the wound in his side. Literally, what Thomas says is, I won't believe it until I see it. I'm not going to believe it. I've got to see it for myself. You know, the question at hand this morning is this, though. The question is, is seeing actually believing? I believe Jesus answers this question when he replied, when he gives a, a reply to Thomas in verse 29. Four verses later, this is what Jesus said. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who believe, watch this now, who believe without seeing. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. You see, this is what I need you to understand. In actuality, you know, we all we, we have what we, the, the five senses. You remember you taught that early on in life. You got the five senses. You, got the, you can smell, you can hear, you can see, you can taste, you can touch. Those are the five senses that you have. In actuality, when it comes to our faith, spiritually speaking, when it comes to our faith, the sense of seeing is not a part of faith at all. It was kind of this quiet in the first service too. The sense of seeing is really not a part of faith at all. As a matter of fact, this is how the word of God answered. It was the great militant missionary apostle Paul who is referred to as the scholar of scholars. He was the teacher of teachers. He was the apostle of apostles. And he made a short statement in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 to the church at Corinth. And this is what he said. He answers that question about seeing. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. You know how the enemy has gotten us in recent days and in recent weeks and months in our society and in our nation 
is that he's got us in a place of, you know, where they tell me right now, I heard it just this week, a study is done that said our society has experienced more stress, more anxiety, more depression than any other society in history. And you know why we're there? Because the enemy has got us to the place, even the church in some places, at looking and dwelling on what we see how many times you heard somebody say, man, just look at it. Just look at the world around us. Just look at what's going on all around us. What, we, what we're doing is we're dwelling on what we see on CNN. We're dwelling what we see on what we see on CBS and ABC and NBC and all those kind of things. But it, we dwell on these things it, that we see. But the sense of seeing is not a part of faith. As a matter of fact, it's answered again in one of the most powerful chapters called the faith chapter in our Bible. Opens up with verse 1 that we're all familiar with. Listen to what it says though. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not. Not what? The evidence of things not seen. I need you to understand today that the sense that sense of seeing is not a part of faith at all. As a matter of fact, this is what I found out. I found out that the sense that plays the greatest role in having faith is that sense of hearing. It's not, what, it's not seeing that, has the greatest, that plays the greatest role. It's hearing. What have you heard? And what you hear is, what, is what's most important. As a matter of fact, you're, you know what your Bible says in Romans 10, 17. It says your faith is comes from where does it come from seeing no it doesn't come from seeing it comes from hearing but it doesn't come from just hearing anything now watch what it says so faith I like this translation because it says so faith comes from hearing and then it says that is hearing the good news about Christ or faith comes from hearing the word of God. It doesn't have anything to do with my sight at all. It has all to do with what I have heard, what has been declared by the word of God. It has all to do from Genesis to Revelation. It has all to do with the fact that the scripture says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. It has all to do with the fact that the scripture says no weapon formed against me as a child of God shall prosper and everything that rises against me in judgment shall be condemned. Amen. It's not about what I see. It's about what I hear. Faith comes by hearing. The greatest sense you have, the thing that plays the greatest role is what you hear by faith. Or in, that, that, that you hear strengthens your face, faith. Now, this is what I want you to notice. Notice after the account of Thomas, when Thomas makes this statement of, I'm not going to believe until I see, and Jesus said what he says to him. Notice in verse 30, there's something given to us today to encourage us not to go on what we see, but to go on what we know. See, hearing has something to do with what you and I know. Verse 30 says this, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But notice what it said. But these are written so that you may continue to do what? So that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. How is it that we have life? by the power of his name, not by what we see, but by what is written. It's by what we know. Sometimes in life, we can walk through valleys. Sometimes in life, we can get to places and situations that are low. 
And when we get to those places, we have to get beyond dwelling where we are at the moment. And we have to close our eyes. And we have to see through the eyes of the Spirit that this may seem like a low place and this may seem like a place where God is not. But, but in all reality, because of what I know, because I know God's word says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God, because I know that God's word says that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according per to his purpose, then I stand here today with my natural eyes closed but my spiritual eyes open seeing what God has for me in my future because every place in life is a place of purpose. It's a part of my destiny. It's a part of where God is taking me. You see, ladies and gentlemen, faith is not about what we see God do. Faith is about what we hear him say. Because if I wait for God to do it, it's not faith at all. Preach on, pastor. If I wait to see something, faith is when I can, I can grasp something without ever having. You see, because here, here's what I need you to understand. When you look at that, that little idiom that we're talking about here today, I'll believe it when I see it. Seeing is believing. You know what that means? It means that only physical or concrete evidence is convincing to me. That's the opposite of faith. Only what I can touch, what I can see, what I can put my hands on, will I believe. Oh, if you're living in that place right now, you're going to stay confused. You're going to stay defeated. But when you can walk in victory is when you can stand for a moment with your eyes closed and you don't have to see anything. You don't have to put your hand on anything to know that God is at work and to know that God will do what he said he would do. Because listen, the, the, every man is a liar, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is the truth. It does not return void, but it will accomplish everything that it sets out to accomplish. Faith's not about what we see. Faith's what, about what we hear, what we know. You see, what's going to get us through these trying times is not what we see right now, but what we know God has already said. What's going to get us through where we are right now is leaning on the everlasting arms of God and his word. Trusting him at his word. How does faith come? It comes by hearing. It is not knowing by faith Or it is no, knowing by faith that though we cannot see sometimes what God is doing, that he is still at work. There's got to be moments in life where we do not see God working, but we trust God is there. There are things to learn from God's word. There are things that should encourage us it has been the fiery furnaces. It has been the lion's den. It has been the moments at the Red Sea. Come on, somebody. That teaches us that though we, are, we when we're standing in places of difficulty and when we're standing in places of impossibility, when we look at something that is greater than we are and we can't see anything happening at the moment, can you imagine what it must have been like for the children of Israel when they walked up to see the Red Sea and there was nothing going on at the 
the moment. But as, but as, the, as faith is being released and as Moses begins to act on what God said to act on, it was in the middle of the night that the Bible said the wind started to blow. And the wind blew and the wind blew and it blew all night long. You see, there are going to be night seasons of your life when the wind is going to start blowing and you're not going to know what at all God is doing, but you just got to trust God because it was the next day that it was the winds that came through the night that parted the water and they were able to walk across on dry land. Is there anybody in this room that for a moment you can close your eyes and even though you can't put your hand on it, you can see it by faith that God is taking you just exactly where he said he would take you. It's knowing by faith that though we can't see it, God is still working. Last week I preached a sermon to you. and We talked about a character in scripture that whenever we think of the word favor, our minds automatically go to Joseph. Why do we go to, why does our mind go to Joseph? Because Joseph was the young man with the coat of many colors. He was the man that was favored not only of his earthly father, but favored of his heavenly father. He was a young man that early in life, God started to give him dreams. And God gave him dreams of where he was going to take him. But his life led him from one place to the next. We talked about it last week. We're not going to go through it all again, but, we, we, but when you read the life of of. of uh, of jo Joseph, we, you see that he went from, from a pit to a palace and to a prison and all of this in God's plan. But there's something interesting in that story. And there's a verse of scripture in the midst of this in chapter 50 of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 50, there's one verse of scripture that I think that's going to explain today what, what it is that God dropped in my spirit for this church. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. What had happened is Joseph is, is at a place with his brothers in life where their father had died. Jacob had died. Joseph and his brothers had made Jacob a promise that they would take him to a particular place and they would bury him in this particular place that he desired to be. Joseph had promised Jacob, and they had taken Jacob. Now watch this. They had taken Jacob to that place of burial, and after they had buried Jacob, then at this moment it dawns on Joseph's brothers that daddy is now dead. And they realized that Joseph is in the position that he had told them about all of those years ago when he was a young boy, the dream that God had given him. Remember what the dream was? The dream was in Joseph's dream, he dreamed that his brothers would bow before him. He dreamed that his father would bow before him. And now, and then when the father has gone, now the brothers are also, not only are they worried about the dream that Joseph had given, they are worried about the fact and they remembered what it was that they did to Joseph. They remembered that they had, that at, at, in the beginning they thought about killing him, but they resorted to throwing him in a pit and selling him into slavery. And now daddy's dead and daddy's not here to protect us. What are we going to do with our little brother now? And that's where we find ourselves this morning in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. And Joseph said something interesting to him. And I want you to get this in your spirit. He said, you intended to harm me. You intended to hurt me. But see, this is what I need you to understand. Some of the folks that God will use to help with your destiny and your dream, the people that God will use sometimes the greatest in your life are the people that you think are your enemies. 
You see, what God does is God is good at turning haters into elevators. Touch somebody next to you, smile real big and say, I hear that. <laughs> he turns haters into elevators. God uses people. And this is what Joseph starts to share with his brothers that were at one time jealous of him and now they're scared and they're afraid of him. He said, boys, don't listen. Listen, don't, don't sweat it. He said, you intended to harm me. But this is, oh man, y'all better get this. He said, you intended to harm me, but God. Somebody say, but God. <laughs> say it again, say, but God. Somebody in this room is about to have a but God moment today. Right here in this church, you're about to have a but God moment because you have been surrounded by enemies. You've been surrounded by haters. You've been surrounded by people that tried to take you out. But God is about to show you that even in the moments when everybody was hating on you and everybody was against you. Watch what he said. You intended to harm me, but God intended, what's those two, those two words, those two words, what are they? It all. It all. It all. Not some, not, 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 no, no, see, that's what's wrong. You see, here's the problem with us right now. In the subject of faith, there's such, the, the subject of faith has been so misconstrued, misconstrued and there's just this misconception about the, what truth faith is because we have a simple-minded idea of faith when we think about faith. And what we've done is we have actually at some times, like I shared with you a few weeks, we've taught faith and we, it's, it's really kind of been heresy. What we've taught is because we've taught that faith is something God gives us to get us out of situations. When faith is not something that gets us out, faith is something that carries us through. Faith is God is something that God gave you because he intended for you to go places. See, there are some places that you thought God wasn't, but God was. See, this is what you need to understand. God was as much God in the pit as he was with Joseph in the palace because the pit was just as much a part of the plan as the palace was a part of the plan. How do you know that? I told you it's written. Did you read it? I didn't say it. The scripture said it what? Not some of it. It it all. That included the pit. That included the prison. We talked about this last week. The prison was just as much as part of the plan because it was in the prison that Joseph was put with what? The prisoners that came from the king's house. He was there with them, and he met a cupbearer who used to be the cupbearer for the king, and the cupbearer needed a dream interpreted. Y'all ain't listening. And Joseph interprets the dream, which puts him, back, puts him in the king's house so that he can interpret for the king so that he can ultimately be in the place that God intended for him to be. Now, let me stop right here and tell y'all something. If you are one of these shallow, faith-minded people that think that God only gave you faith to get you a new Toyota, or Cadillac, or Mercedes, or BMW, or Ford, or whatever. If you think that's all, and that's all faith is, then you miss the whole thing. God's got a greater plan for you than a particular automobile or a particular address. God's got a greater plan for you than you wearing a particular name brand shoe. Ladies, thank God for red sole shoes, but that ain't where God's taking you. God has a greater plan than that. And this, now notice what Joseph says. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save, watch this now, y'all, the lives of many people. 
when you are operating in faith and you get the real revelation of faith and why God has you to be a woman or a man of faith, that it doesn't become about you anymore. It becomes about your purpose now and that God has given you another level of faith and you, you, had, you had to be tried in the pit and you had to be tried in this position and you had to go through that valley because God was trying something in you and God was developing something in you and it wasn't so that you could have a certain house or so you could drive a certain car or you could have a certain social status, but it was because God was going to use you as a world changer. You see, Joseph was a dream. Dreamer. He was a real dreamer. But his life was not just going to make a difference in him and his brothers and his father, but God gave him a dream that would change the entire world. And watch this, y'all. Watch this. Look at us. Here we are today in this room, still learning and living off Joseph's dream. <laughs> Still being inspired by that young man's dream, by the faith that says, you intended to harm me, but I knew what the pit was for. You see, real faith, real faith is not in the palace. Real faith is in the pit. Because when you're in the pit, you, you can't rely on what you see. You have to rely on what you heard and what you know. It was in the pit that Joseph had to close his eyes. Because all of his surroundings says, you're a slave. At that moment, you're a slave. You're not a dreamer, you're a slave. You belong to somebody. You're somebody's possession. But it's at that moment that Joseph would have to close his eyes and go back in time and remember a dream and remember what God said. You see, the faith, the faith that Joseph, Joseph's faith was not built in the house of Potiphar. In the house of Potiphar, we talked about that. God helped him with his integrity. But his faith was built when he was in the pit when he couldn't see any of the promise. That is, as a matter of fact, all the surroundings around him were anti-promise. How can you... You see, do this with me right now. Close your eyes. It's in these moments of life when you can't see anything. But guess what? You can still hear. You can still hear the voice of someone declaring, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You can still hear the voice. Faith comes by what? Hearing. You can still hear the voice of someone. Someone declaring. He sent his word and he healed all my diseases. You can still hear the words of someone declaring, if God be for me, then who can be against me? You can still hear the word being declared that I am more than a conqueror. You can hear the words when you're in a pit, in a place of slavery. The word of the Lord rings forth that says, I am part of a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people. I have been adopted into the family of God. I am the head and I'm not the tail. I'm above and not, and not beneath only. It's in those moments of life that God builds in us the faith. to go where God is taking us. Now let me say this to you and then we're going to pray in just a moment.
The thing that us preachers are guilty of more than anything else. Us preachers are guilty of preaching sermons like I preach today and preaching them in a way like we got this and y'all need some real help. How many of you are tired of preaching like that? I am. I'm tired of preachers standing up and acting like I've got this divine revelation. I'm walking on this level of faith and in this plane with God that y'all don't know nothing about. I'm going to talk to somebody who wants me to be real with them. Y'all don't know nothing about this. I'm up here living up here and y'all down there living down there. One day y'all going to get up here where I am. See, if that's the kind of, of idea you got about this pastor, you are going to be disappointed. If you think, because here's the thing about that is, is if there's somebody here that really, really needs the grace of God and really needs the mercy of God and really needs God to help them with their faith, I'm the first one to raise my hand. If y'all got to have a pastor that's already arrived and, 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 they, and they got wings growing out the back or something, then this is not the church for you because I'm going to be the one to tell you that when God started speaking this in my spirit, I was the first one to raise my hand all by myself and say, God, I'm not there yet. I'm still having trouble in the pits of life. I still have trouble when I'm in the valley. I still have trouble believing and still have trouble standing on the word of God. See, come here. Come here, Justin. See, this is, this is what I want y'all to realize, and this is what God, I believe that, that the object of this lesson today is this, to get, to get you to understand this. There was a man who came to Jesus one day, and he, and, and he made a statement that it sounded almost like he was contradicting himself when he said to the Lord, I believe, but then he said, but, but help my unbelief. Now, what kind of sense does that make? Well, if you think about it, it makes all the sense in the world. As he was saying, I got some faith, but I still need to grow. I've had faith, but I'm struggling right now. You see, this is how the enemy has beat the church up, is that we, 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 we've had this, this, this faith that's been preached to the church like, we're all sinners because if, if you had had faith, Justin, if you'd only had faith, you'd have never went through that. That ain't what Joseph said. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all. See, we've been messing folks up. We've been making people feel like because they went through a valley in life and because they had a hard time, they didn't have any faith. And another thing we need to realize too is, is that in moments like these, God's trying to teach us all something. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but I have not arrived. I'm still being affected by what everybody's saying about COVID-19. I'm still being affected about why, by what people are saying about the economy. I'm still being affected by those things around me. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe God brought us to this church today to help our unbelief. Lord, let my faith grow to believe you that you are working in every moment of my life. You know, when you, you know when you give the devil a fit? Is when you can see God every day. When you can celebrate in God every day. Today I don't feel good, but God's still God. Today my car's broke down, but guess what? God's still God. Oh, come on somebody. Guess what? I forgot to pay the light bill and they turned the lights off. But guess what? 
God's gone in the dark as well as he is when the lights are on. I'm trying to find somebody in this room that knows that God brought you to the church today to help you get through this season of your life, to help you get through this hardship in your life, to help you know that God is still God and he's still working though you are somewhere you don't desire to be. Y'all, 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 y'all. Y'all sit down just a moment and I'm going to quit. How much further along would we be if we didn't beat divorced people up? How much further along would we be if we could embrace someone who just gone through divorce and not beat them up over divorce? If we could be there and say, hey, you know what? God loves you even through this situation. How much further along would we be if we could help somebody that's been struggling with an alcohol problem and they've been doing good, but one day they mess up and they go back and they take a drink? How much further along would we be if we could just wrap our arms around them and say, hey, God's going to give you a faith for the next level, the faith that you had to stay off of alcohol for the last three months is the same faith God's going to give you. You just got to do what? You just got to get back up. What if we reminded somebody that a a righteous man falls seven times, but he just gets right on back up, that there is a, a faith for the next level. Wherever you are, wherever you are today, wherever you are, there's faith for it. It's faith to get you through it. And you don't have to see it. You don't have to touch it. All you got to do is know it. His word. Jesus was a perfect, became a perfect example of everything he taught. He would never teach us to do something that he did not show us how it was to be done. When he taught a parable, when he taught a story, whatever he he taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the four gospels, everything he taught, he was an example of. How does faith come? By seeing? No, by? So what's important is what you know. What's important as a child of God is what is written. So what does Jesus do? He becomes an example after 40 days of not eating and 40 days of being tempted and tried by the devil. 40 days of not eating. 40 days without food. Some of y'all go a day. Some of us go a day. And we're like, I got to find something. I got to find something. I remember my mother who's in heaven today bless her little heart my mother was a little stocky lady my mama loved to eat come on now she loved to eat and her she liked to eat stuff that wasn't, she was a diabetic she liked to eat stuff that wasn't good for her. she liked to eat something that wasn't good for her and then go take some insulin come on somebody you know what I mean <laughs> bless her little heart this was what she'd say you know how people say my sugar's dropping and I need to get myself a piece of candy or, 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 or an apple or something. My mom would say, oh, God, I feel my sugar dropping. Stop me by Taco Bell. <laughs> she was a mess. My mama was. Bless her heart. Wish I could wrap my arms around her right now. Let me tell you this. Jesus, 40 days without anything to eat. There's a lesson, y'all. There's a lesson deeper than we've ever even seen until this moment. 40 days without anything to eat. And he is, and I'm going to be real with y'all. He's faced with this, and the enemy says, okay, if you are who you say you are, turn that stone into bread. Let me tell you something I ain't never told you before. You know what I think Jesus did? I think he was, I think he wanted to turn it into bread right then. Oh, come on. The Bible said he was tempted likewise as all men was ever tempted. I believe the first thought Jesus had was not to say, see, that's what's wrong with it. No, I think his first thought was, hey, that's a good idea. Big Mac in Jesus' name. (laughs) Huh? I believe that. Whataburger. 
for you wonderful folks from Destin, Florida here, there. If y'all never been there, I'm telling you, they're going to have Whataburger at the marriage supper of the lamb. I believe it. Come on, somebody. I believe that was his first thought. But he had to catch himself. So it's not by what I see. It's about what I know. And he says these words, it is written. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do we hear the word of God? We hear it with our ears today. It's not what I see. It's not what I can put my hand on. You see, is seeing believing? Not at all. Believing is knowing what you do not see. And it becomes in your mind a reality. Before you ever put your hand on it, you see it as fact. That's what faith is. Would you stand with me all over the room? I feel the challenge today is this. I feel where God is challenging us is in the place of just being real about our faith. Where are you today? Boy, I sense his presence moving across this room right now. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Let this be a moment in your presence, God. That will strengthen and build faith. I believe the invitation that God would have me to give today is this. Are you here today and you say, Pastor, I'm going to be real. I'm like that man that went to Jesus. I, I've, I've, I've had faith, but... I want to say, Lord, help my faith. Some of you are in positions right now in your life going through struggles that you cannot see God in them. You're going through things and facing situations that you just can't see God in it. And it's a time that God needs to increase your faith. My faith is low, Pastor. I just got to be real with you. The last week of my life, the last two days, the last three days, the last week, the last two weeks have just been a low for me. I'm, I'm just struggling in my faith. And you know what? That's okay. As long as you're in the position where you can stand and raise your hand and say, I'm struggling in my faith, you're in a good position. God can help you in that position. You get in a position that you cannot admit it is where God can't help you. But when you can always be helped when you realize you need, that's what the man says, hey, I have faith, but help my unbelief. In other words, I could use more. In other words, I'm struggling in this moment. I'm struggling right now in this moment. I believe God brought you here. I believe there are people under the sound of my voice that God brought you here for the sole purpose today to build your faith, to encourage you, to remind you that it's not by what's in front of you, what you see right now, but it's what you know by his word. He's a healer. You can't change that. Isaiah 53, 5 cannot be changed. His word goes forth and does not return void. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed in Jesus' name. That's God's word. That's what I stand on, not what I see, but what I have heard and I know. you're here in this room and this is not for everybody this is for the ones you know God's speaking to you right now your faith has been low you've been struggling and you need your faith to be increased right now you need you know God brought you here for that reason pastor I've been struggling I just need him to help me with my faith lift your hand let me see if that's you that's you come on you know that's you that's you that you know God spoke to you today 
You know God's doing something for you today. I see your hands. I see you. I see I see some of your tears flowing down your face. I see what God's doing in you. I see the moment that you're in right now. God is building and increasing faith. If that's you, if that was you, if you lifted your hand, I want you to come stand with me right now in the name of Jesus. And we're going to believe that before you walk out of this room, before you walk out of this room today, God is going to have increased your faith today. We're going to believe that. We're going to believe that today. We're going to believe it.